It's so good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Let's stand up and give him praise. Lord, you are good. We praise you. We lift you high. We come to magnify you, Jesus, because you alone deserve the glory. You deserve the honor and the praise. We come to lift you high and to thank you, Jesus, to thank you for your mercy and your grace. Hallelujah.
presence of the Lord tonight. Let's greet our visitors and welcome each other. Praise the Lord, everyone. So excited to be in church on a Sunday night. Just got a couple of announcements. If I can have your attention, just please remember next Sunday, which is September 5th, be Labor Day. We will only have one service. We will not have PM service uh, next week. Be sure to spend that time with your family and let's have a good time of fellowship together. Church, anybody excited about the Songs of the Nation tour? Yes, that tour will be held here at our church. Please get your tickets, New Life Church family. Uh, the tickets are being sold at a high clip, so be sure to get yours if you would like to participate. That is on November 5th. Get your tickets as soon as you can. I believe God will move in this place. It's always a dynamic time when Brother James Wilson comes to minister. I'm so excited about the concert. Bible quizzing will be starting back soon. This is a great opportunity for your kids to get the word of God in their hearts. Brother Israel be, will be in the foyer tonight uh, taking people who would like to sign up for Bible quizzing. And also you can sign up on our church website. Just go find the link for New Life Bible Quizzing. And if you have more questions, see Brother Israel or the Tisdales for more information about that. And church family, please continue to be faithful in your tithes and in your offerings. Please give on newlifebhm.com and also on our church center app. Anybody excited to be in church tonight? Anybody's going to lift up the name of Jesus? Come on, why don't we start clapping our hands right now? Let's exalt the name of Jesus. Let's lift his name up and let's worship with them as they sing.
I'm here to tell you tonight that Jesus is in this place. And if you have a need in this house, God will meet you tonight. If you need something from him, the portals are open. The spirit is stirred in this house tonight. If you just lift up your heart and lift up your mind and lift up your hands to him right now to receive what he has for you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Can be moved. They say. 
say these chains will never break.
special needs in this house tonight. Israel, if you come, why don't you lift up Brother Blast right now. We want to continue to pray for him. He has sickness in his body. We continue to lift him up in that church family there in St. Louis. Pray that God touches him in his body. Sister Murray, why don't you lift up your dad right now? Let's continue to lift him up in this house tonight. Brother Reggie, if you can lift up Brother Al, Brother Antoine's father-in-law, we need to continue to lift him up and pray for him. He needs a touch of God in his body. Let's lift up Sister Pate, Sister Linda Pate. Want to continue to lift her up and pray for her tonight. Somebody take on Sister Cynthia Hagedorn. Take her on your heart tonight. Let's lift her up. Hallelujah. We got needs all over this house. If you know a need that was not spoken of, why don't you lift that need up right now? God is in this house. He's moving in this house tonight. Why don't you just take some time and petition God on behalf of these that are sick. Hallelujah. Let's touch the throne room of God right now.
God good tonight? And don't you love being in his presence? And hadn't he been good to you? Ah, we give you praise, oh God, we magnify your name. So good to be in the Lord's house on a rainy Sunday night. I'm excited about what God is doing. And uh, it's good to see our friends, the Romes, in the house tonight. Uh, they may have come because they just love us and can't stay away. And they might have had something to do with a gal named Ida, too. Uh, so I'm not really sure. But uh, you want to pray for our church families in the New Orleans area and up in South uh, Louisiana in that corridor around Lafayette and all those small towns in those uh, low areas. They are getting hammered right now. And so you want to be in prayer. A lot of churches there, a lot of great churches there. And you want to, you want to make sure that you pray for them. Somebody say praise the Lord. So um, life, is, uh, life is seasonal. And uh, tonight we're in, a, we're in a season of time. Uh, there are seasons of time when you have to hunker down from storms. And there's a season of time. We're, uh, we're in a little COVID season right now. We've got about 15 cases uh, in and around the church family, but they are so separated from one another. It makes me think it's not a church thing. It's a statewide thing. It's happening everywhere. But for this season, we're going to go ahead and have church. We're not going to close down like we did last time. We're just going to have church. Now, for you, uh, this is just, everybody's got a preference about this and everybody's trying to make sense of it and walk it as well as they can. If you want to come to church, you come to church. If you want to wear a mask, you wear a mask. If you want to, if you want to stay home and watch online, do that. But don't do that too long. Staying home and watching online is a good thing, but you'll start drifting. You can't live for God all by yourself in your living room listening online. You need the people of God and you need the house of God. Somebody say praise the Lord. So we did that for a good long haul uh, last year. We're not going to do that again. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just telling you, it's, it's a season. It's just a season. But there's a time and a season for everything. And, and in every season, God is still God. He is a God for all seasons. And he's a God when the storms are coming. And he's a God when the pestilence is afoot. And I'll just tell you, out of the middle of it all, he can reach in and pull out something really good. And in the middle of it all, the promise of God is yet real and alive. And the truth of God is yet real and alive. And we're going to give him praise in the house tonight. Why don't you just stop for a minute, clap your hands and lift your voice and magnify him. And Give him all the glory that he's worthy of tonight. We magnify you, oh God. Well, praise God. So we're going to give God praise and thanks and give him all the glory. And uh, we're going to see what God will do in the house tonight. I appreciate the good preaching in the house this morning. And uh, I appreciate our musicians and our, and our singers and the brave people in the praise group and, uh, that come and serve and help us to make our way into the presence of God. And I'll just tell you, the music today was just exceptionally good, just wonderful and beautiful and made me want to live for God. I think I will. At this late stage in my life, I think I'm going to make a turn and really live for God. I believe it's going to happen. We're going to read tonight from 2 Samuel 20. We're so glad to have our guests and visitors in the house tonight. And uh, come back on a normal Sunday night and we'll, we'll uh, take you some places. Uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 20, beginning in verse 1 and then some selected verses through this passage. And there happened to be there a man of Belial, of the devil, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king. From Jordan even to Jerusalem. This is after that business with Absalom. And everybody's a little bit disjointed about what to do and where to go. And they came and besieged him. Uh, Bikri, or, or Sheba the son of Bikri, he went and took refuge in a town called Abel. 
And Joab and the boys came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah. They cast up a bank against the city and it stood in the trench. And all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. And then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say I pray unto you, unto Joab. Come near hither that I may speak with thee. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am he. And then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. And she spake, saying, They were wont, or they wished, to speak in old times, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel. This is the city they're in. And so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. And thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why will thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And jo Joab answered and said, far, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. The matter is not so. But a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. Then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent. And Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king. If you love his word tonight, as you're seated, let's give God praise and thanks for his word that is forever settled in the heavens. We praise you, O God. We thank you for the privilege to handle your word in this house tonight. We thank you, mighty God, for all the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the, and the anointing and the blessing that you've given us, oh God. We praise you for this, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Praise God. So this is uh, after this rebellion business with Absalom. And Absalom is dead, and Joab has seen to that. And uh, David's own son has risen up against him. And now Absalom and his armies are scattered. And David has consolidated Judah. But Israel is having a little bit of trouble with all of this turbulence that's going on in the kingdom. And a guy named Sheba rises up and blows a trumpet and calls Israel together as if to resist or to rebel against uh, uh, David. And this is following those old fracture lines that were established by, uh, by Saul early on. <clears throat> and Joab goes down and Joab besieges the city because they know that if just something like this is left untended that it's just going to fester and it'll be a problem. And so he sends Joab and a lot of the mighty men after Sheba and he winds up at a town called Abel and they go about the business of war. They're setting up their, their uh, trenches and their mounds and they're getting ready to besiege and to breach the wall and to go in and to do business and a lot of people are going to get hurt. <laughs> If that happens, and this woman, this wise woman, she comes to the wall and she said, Joab, do you know that this is a place that used to be counted a place for counsel and people would come here for wise counsel? She said, I'm a mother of Israel. Why are you trying to swallow up the inheritance of the Lord and destroy a city? And jo Joab said, well, I'm not really doing that. I'm just coming for this one guy. She said, hang on a second. And she goes down into the city and she appeals to the city people and they look out the wall and they see the army that's amassed outside and they call for Sheba and they cut his head off and they throw it out to the army of, uh, of David. And then everything goes away and all the pressure is off. And I just want to stop here for just a second and I want to tell you 
When the hand or the word of judgment comes to your house, comes to your heart's door, comes to your life, don't protect and hold dear something that's going to bring you to destruction. Be wise like the woman in this story. And when God knocks on your door and requires something of you, you make sure you throw it out. There is nothing in your life that is worth the absence of God. There's nothing in your life that is worth being alienated from God. Somebody say praise the Lord. I'm just telling you, and I could go through a list of all kinds of things that people do tonight that are not pleasing to God, and the judgment of God or the Word of God will come knocking on your door, but I'm just telling you, right now, for the most part, uh, a good number of you know already if you have something like that in your life, and so don't, don't hesitate. Here we are. We're in the presence of God. We're at the house of God. There's an altar here. There's an opportunity here. You're breathing and you're alive and you've got a moment here. And I would just suggest that you round up your sheep up and cut its head off and bring it up here to this altar and throw it over the wall tonight and be done with the matter. You know what's standing between you and God. You know what's standing between you and actualizing the potential of God. You know what's standing between you and the calling and the goodness and the gifts and the and the ministry of God and I'm not calling you to a pulpit I'm just saying everybody has a ministry you don't need to be running lower you don't need to be operating at a lower level than God has intended for you somebody say praise the Lord let's clap our hands unto the Lord and magnify his name what a good God So, David, David is a man after God's own heart. David is the beloved of God. David is the greatest king of all of Israel, the Bible says so. And David is the consolidator of the inheritance of God. He's the only king of Israel that conquered all the area that God made available and, uh, and spoke to Israel about David is mighty and fearless in battle. David is the giant killer. David is the sweet psalmist of Israel. And, and he is unlike anybody else. But have you noticed we're about done with our studies of David for the most part. Have you noticed that as we've been going through these studies, David, who is uh, uh, an Old Testament typology of Christ in many ways, Brother Stephen alluded to that this morning, uh, you, you have to know that David is not only the greatest king, but he's a role model. He's what you want to be. He's what our little kids in Sunday school want to be. They, they make little, little uh, cardboard and uh, yarn slings, and they, they kill giants in Sunday school with that. They still talk about David and the greatness of David. And I know his problems, and I know his mistakes, but David is a role model for anybody that wants to be close to God. But have you noticed that all during this story, there's always a problem? There's always a challenge. There's always, there's always something coming against David. He's a shepherd boy, and he's tending at Jesse's sheep and, and just doing his job. And here comes a lion, and here comes a bear, and he's a good boy, and he's faithful, and he's honoring his father. But, but doing the right thing does not mean that those things that seek to destroy won't come to your life and come to your house. His brothers uh, hold him in slight contempt when he, when he goes down to battle, goes down to the army camp. And in the day that he's going to kill Goliath, nobody knows that yet. His brothers deride him and they make fun of him and talk about how mischievous he is. And, and David is as a psalmist and he's... He plays music and he sings and that gets him drafted into the presence of the king and, and an evil spirit from the Lord. David is called on to, to per, uh, perform an exorcism on Saul as it were. And then there's that giant in the valley and then there's Saul that goes off on him and tries to pin him to a wall with a javelin and chases him all over the wilderness and there's Philistines and there's Ammonites and Amalekites and and then his own 
flesh and blood rebels against him and, and Absalom breaks his heart and Absalom uh, dies in, in a place of, of treachery against his dad and there are traitors involved in all of these movements and, and just as soon as that business with Absalom is resolved our text for tonight somebody else rising up against the king Joab said this man Sheba he has lifted up his hand against King David and that's what our text was about and as soon as that head bounces off the ground and that little drama is finished and we're moving on to something else they go down to battle again down around the area of Gath where there are still giants and there's a giant by the name of Ishbenabob that thought to kill David and Ishbenabob which was of the sons of the giant the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight he being girded with a new sword thought it thought to have slain David but Abishai the son of Zeruah secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him then the men of David swear unto him saying thou shalt no more go out with us to battle that thou quench not the light of Israel and so David's getting a little older and he goes out into battle and he's not able anymore to just take on the giant and somebody has to cover for him and then they begin to say let's keep you back at the house we really don't want you to get out into battle and because you're the light of Israel and we don't want the light to be quenched and so then he's moving into a season with an inexorable enemy. He's moving into a season with an enemy unlike he's ever faced before. It's just the enemy of age and the breakdown, the entropic effect of, of life and nature on your body and he's dying. And then of course the cold hand of death is going to reach out and touch David. In the next couple of chapters we find his last song and we find that the prayers of David, the son of Jesse are ended and so there's always something from the time he's a kid in the field all the way down to the moment where age crumples his body and saps his strength and then he dies the death of every mortal that will ever be on the earth and, and we've said it before I'll say it again to you tonight there is no happily ever after on this earth you can come pretty close to some really good things and the blessings of God are real and this is the best way to live and to walk in this world but I'll just tell you tonight you thought you were the only one that was having a problem you thought you were the only one as soon as you got this done something else would rise up and as soon as you kill the giant somebody else comes up and you've got another problem let me tell you David is the apex in the Old Testament and David has problems from his youth to his old age and Stephen was dealing with uh, the, the, uh, the perfect model the perfect example today and he was dealing with the Christ and the Christ had enemies and trouble and suffering and pain all through his earthly journey it's not just you turn to your neighbor and tell him it's not just you listen we are we are in for a fight we are in for a struggle we are in uh, a place of pain and at some level we are going to have some more suffering uh, before we get to the other side. Man it, that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of troubles. Everybody say full of trouble. So if you think you've got a little trouble in your life, well, you are absolutely a product of the Scripture. The Scripture says you're going to have a short life, and it's going to be full of trouble. And, it's, and I'll just tell you, we're living in one of the best cultures that's ever existed on the face of the earth. We're living at one of the best moments that you could live, and we're in the church of the living God. Now, that's as good as it gets. And to the degree that you apply the principles of the kingdom of God, it doesn't get any better in this world it doesn't get any better than living for God it doesn't get any better than coming to the house of God it doesn't get any better than laying my sins down in an altar it doesn't get any better than letting God shoulder up under my burden and under my grief and under my trouble it doesn't get any better than the fellowship of the people of God it doesn't get any better than the family of God I'm just telling you this is the best 
best life. This is the best that there is in the existential journey. But there's in the middle of the valley and in the middle of the trouble and in the middle of the pain, it's still pain. But in the, in the moment, Paul says, we don't mourn like they mourn. We don't hurt like they hurt. Because we've got an undergirding hope. And we've got the undergirding word of God. And we've got healing that comes. And we've got God's goodness and strength that comes. And there's all kinds of miraculous interaction that takes on as we walk through this natural existential thing. You know, you want to make sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. And you got to understand there's a lot of room for human error. You don't want to complicate your natural situation. And you don't want to cause yourself problems. It's kind of like that business of throwing the head out over the wall of the city. You don't don't want to have something in your life or in your experience that is res- uh, restricting the flow of God in your life. You want to make sure that you're living for God at an optimum level and that you get all the clutter out. And every day you want to pray the Lord's Prayer and you want to pray the prayer of repentance and you want to ask God, is there any wicked thing in me? Is there anything you see in me, God? You want to spend time with God every day praising Him and worshiping Him and seeking the kingdom in His will. But But you also want to be very, very vulnerable and transparent in that prayer. And you want God to talk to you about things that need to change and things that need to be thrown over the wall. You want to to grow uh, closer to God as you go. Even if you're David, it doesn't matter who you are here. If you're a psalmist, if you're a musician and a singer, uh, you're a Sunday school teacher, you're your uh, Bible study teacher, doesn't matter who you are, you're going to walk through all the trouble of the existential journey. There's something here that is devoted to stealing and killing and destroying. There's something here that is, that is hateful and murderous. There's something here that is always something with which to contend. There's always an obstacle And there's always a giant. And my wife, early on in our tenure in Birmingham, had a dream about the strong man of the city. And and I won't tell you the whole story again. It's simply that uh, it it was really interesting. It was in two parts, several months apart, the dream and its parts. And uh, she saw this great big muscular man preening under the lights in an auditorium. And he was just fearsome, a giant of a man to look at. And the Holy Ghost said, you're going to fight him. And uh, she's like 120 pounds soaking wet. And, uh, and she was in her dream a little resistant to that, to that idea. And uh, so uh, the dream stopped. And several months later, it came back right at that place. And she's walking into that auditorium. And God told her she could. And so she's going to. And she meets him about halfway down the aisle. And she just hauls off and nails him. Bam. And uh, when she hits him, she sees that he shrinks. And then she's into it. It's like, oh, yeah. And so bam, 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 bam. Every time she'd hit him, he'd get a little smaller, a little smaller. And then he's just little manageable little little muscular man, you know. She said, can I kill him? And the Holy Ghost said, you'll never kill him. He'll always be there. But you can keep him in this condition. So I, I want to tell you, your enemy is manageable, and your enemy is confrontable, and your enemy is somebody that you... He said, I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I want you to know that God's given you what you need to overcome all of these things. But the encounters won't ever stop. And the confrontations won't ever quit. And you get it done today. 
Stephen was dealing with the temptation in the wilderness. And the Bible said that when Satan had finished all temptation, he left him for a season. He left him for a minute. He's a faithful devil. He's coming back tomorrow. You whip him today, you're going to have to whip him again tomorrow. But I want you to know, you can whip him. You just can't get tired of the fight. You can't get tired. you got to be ready to ring the bell again. You've got to be ready to go another round. You say, how many rounds? I don't know how many rounds until he comes. Until happy ever after does come. Until the king returns that's how long that's how long you might be tired but ring the bell we're going to fight again another season we're on our way to happily ever after and I'll just tell you I've made up my mind nothing's going to get between me and the promise of God nothing's going to get between me and the revival that God's promised nothing's going to get between me and that great getting up morning clap your hands lift your voice You know, as soon as we come into the kingdom of God, we're instantly behind enemy lines. As soon as you get the Holy Ghost, as soon as you get baptized in Jesus' name, what used to be friendly territory to you is now enemy territory. What used to be something you were comfortable with, it's not comfortable anymore. I remember when those first convictions were starting to move on us when we just first had received the Holy Ghost. In places we had gone a hundred or a thousand times, now the Holy Ghost in us was going, "Mm, you can't be here. Mm, You feel uncomfortable. Mm, I can't have my children in a place like this. And without anybody preaching or anybody telling us, there were places that we stopped going because God was talking to us now from the inside. I was no longer part of that but I had dropped in behind enemy lines and into enemy territory somebody say praise the Lord that's exactly what Stephen was talking about this morning when he's talking about Jesus down on the earth come to seek and to save that which was lost he was alien to this world he was not a part of this world but he loved you so much he came down to this world in the form of a man to take on flesh and be a sacrifice for our sins and he came behind the enemy lines it wasn't new to him It wasn't new to him. He had been there before. Because he's everywhere. You say, yeah, well, that's right. But you remember that story where they they took the Ark of the Testament into into battle ill-advisedly. And the Philistines whipped them and stole their God. And God was just in the box, just docile and just hanging out and not doing anything. He didn't fight for Israel because Israel was, was a bunch of stinkers and they weren't, they weren't living right and they were doing things that were an abomination to God. And so God just let them get their ears pinned back and they, they lost that war. And, and then his box, his command central on earth got set up in the house of Dagon, the God of the Philistines. And there is God behind the enemy lines. And he waits till everybody clears out. And he just reaches out and bam, slaps Dagon down on his face. And he does that for three days. And while he's doing it, he just by being God just says, all right, give me emeralds in all their private parts. God does that. God doesn't have to lift a finger. He just says it. He says, give me little tumors, little vexations, all in some sensitive areas in their bodies. And before it was over, those Philistines, their God had his head and his hands cut off, and they were crippled up with a bunch of little tumors in their body. And it's really a funny story. But but God was behind the enemy lines, and he didn't stop being God, and he didn't stop being powerful, and he didn't stop being the truth and the bastion of heaven. And he didn't stop any of that. He just kept right on being God. Well, you know what God's called you to do now that he's filled you with his spirit and called you by his name? God has turned you. You used to be the enemy, but now you're the friend of God. God has turned you. You used to be a child of the devil, but now you're a child of God. God has turned you. And now 
You're an insurgent force behind enemy lines. Praise God. And it's not happy ever after here. We're in a war. And it's not the place of paradise that many people are looking for. Not here. Because we're down in the trenches. And we're down in the dirt. And we're down in the trouble. And we're a part of the kingdom of God in the earth. And all that the word of God has to say about that. None of, the, none of that is alleviated until the trump sounds. And we find ourselves on the other side. This summer we celebrated again the memorial of D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, when the Allied forces landed in Normandy and made their European invasion. We'd already gone ashore in Italy and bounced off northern Africa, but this, this was the big show. This was when we were coming in, and this is where we were going to turn the tide. And the day before, the day before D-Day, the day before the Armada landed there along the beaches at Normandy, the 101st and the 82nd Airborne units uh, parachuted into Normandy along with some British and Canadian paratroopers, and they jumped hours before the invasion. They came in, they were riding in about a 1,000 C-47s, and they were flying too low. And they were flying too fast because the flak was so thick and it was so dangerous. And those pilots were nervous out of their minds. And a lot of those planes went down. And all they wanted to do was get that cargo off and get turned back around toward the English Channel. And so those guys were jumping way too fast and way too low to the ground. And they got scattered all over Normandy. And there were gliders coming in with more troops and gliders coming in with with a lot of provision and a lot of equipment. And those things were scattered everywhere. The Germans had flooded the deltas. They had flooded, broken down the dikes. And they had uh, created uh, death traps of water all over. And it was night. You couldn't see a thing. And those guys were coming down in water that was too deep to stand in. And they had to find one another. And they had to regroup in the, in the, uh, in the night. And they had these little clickers. And they had uh, passwords. And it was... Was, it was war from the very beginning. They started shooting the, at the planes when they were first coming in. And then they landed right in the middle of a lot of German uh, emplacements and a lot of uh, German activity there. And they were surrounded when they dropped in. But they were there for a mission. And they were there because their country had called on them. And they were preparing for those guys that were going to come on the beach. There were some big guns back up in Normandy that was going to cut those guys on the beaches to, to ribbons. But the, those, those guys out of the 101st and the 82nd, those paratroopers, they were trained for this. And they were going to go in and take out those gun emplacements and make it less lethal and less deadly to come ashore there. And uh, Major Richard Winters, he said, when somebody mentioned to him that they were surrounded, he just simply said, we are airborne. We're supposed to be surrounded. We drop into the middle of the trouble. We are not afraid to be in the middle. We've got enemies all around us. And we understand the nature of the job when we, when we sign on. But he said we're airborne. We're supposed to be surrounded. Can I tell you? We are the church of the living God. And we have a mission. And we are behind enemy lines. And we are the church. We're supposed to be surrounded. We're supposed to be surrounded by enemies we are the salt of the earth we are the children of God we are the light of the world we're supposed to be surrounded by darkness it's all around us tonight but you shouldn't be troubled by that don't ever look out and start oh the world's so bad the world's so bad of course it's bad that's why God sent you into the world that's why God came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost look at them they're lost you're in the right place look at them they're the world you are in the right place let's give God a little praise and let's magnify him
They were getting ready for the big day. They were getting ready for that invasion day. But they were getting ready for that liberation day. And they were behind enemy lines. And I'll just tell you, church, that's who we are. We're getting ready for that great day. Don't get caught up in how rough it is, how hard it is, how heavy the load, how m murky the mud. David said, I was in a deep pit. I was in a, I was in a place, and I called out to God, and God heard my cry, and he lifted me up out of that pit, and he set my feet on a rock, and he established my goings, and that's exactly what he's done for every one of us. But I'm just going to tell you, there's still a battle to be won, and there's still an enemy to be overcome, and there are still souls. To, you know, God's going to win somebody the last day the day before the rapture God's going to win somebody somebody's going to get the Holy Ghost right before the trump sounds somebody's going to get baptized I don't know what it's going to look like I don't know who all's going to be left standing I don't know what the geopolitical scenario is going to be look like going to look like but I will tell you this as long as we're here we need to be looking for the next one as long as we're here we need to be standing in a place to provide the kingdom of God for whoever who Whoever needs it, let's give God a little praise and magnify Him. We're on our way. We're on our way to a place where there's no more crying, there's no more tears, there's no more pain. We're on our way to every day with Jesus and everything is beautiful. We're on our way to that place, but we're not in that place right now. We're on our way. To happily ever after if you ever get in a place where the devil can access you and he starts telling you well this is not happy ever after you're not everything's not perfect since you've been in church you still have struggles and you still have problems and you still have difficulties and you still have challenges and you need to say well that's right devil you're very observant you're a smart devil it, it, a moron can see that I'm still in the world and the world is still the world Don't don't ever let him get in close to you and start pointing out the obvious and, and telling you that that's there because you're living for God. Friend of mine, if you would walk out on God right now, you would still have all the existential woe and pain and trouble. And I would tell you, you're going to have a lot more than those that are living for God. I'll just tell you, this is the best way to live. But leaving God, leaving the church, you're not going to get any better in your life. You're not going to have any closer uh, association with heaven happy ever after there's only one place you're going to find happy ever after and that's over on the other side and there's only one way you're going to get there and that's living for God with all of your heart and that's praising God with all of your heart and that's serving God with all of your hearts somebody say amen, amen. we're the church we're surrounded our commander in chief said if the world hates you you know it hated me before it hated you oh God all my friends turned against me. Well, they hated me first. That's what he's telling you. Don't get all sidetracked in, in how the world feels about you. He said, it hated me first. And now you're a part of something that the world hates. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. They see you. They recognize you as an enemy. They recognize you as the, under, uh, the, the undercutting of everything that they want and everything they believe. I mean, it's like they've got a list right now. They're trying to, an agenda they're trying to achieve. And it's like they took the word of God and made a long list of what God likes and then begin to, begin to advocate for everything that's not like the word of God. The word of God loves marriage. Now, the world hates marriage. Now, the word of God uh, presents you with uh, men and women only. Only in the, in the presentation of humanity. And now the world wants something else other than that. The world wants to scatter it and destroy it. And, uh, and I'm just going to tell you that uh, we are, we are, the, we are the, the uh, extension of the kingdom of God into the world to say, hey, there's a better way. You don't have to go that way. There's a healthier way for you. And uh, John would say to the church, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. And Jesus would say about the church, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world. G Jesus in his prayer 
he said I'm not praying that you get removed out of the world I'm not praying that you would be absolved from all your worldly responsibility that I've called you to but that thou should keep them from the evil they are not of the world say I am not of the world say I am not of the world even, Jesus said, even as I am not of the world. I want you to know we are in it, but we are not of it. We're passing through it, but it's not our home. My dreams are not here, and my heart is not here. You better lay up some treasure in heaven, because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I've got my eye on happy ever after. And while I'm in the middle of the fight, I want you to know I'm thinking it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth every mile, every fight, every disappointment, every time I've gotten knocked down. It's going to be worth it all because I've got my eye on happy ever after. I've got my heart set on living forever with God. Is there anybody here that plans to live forever with God? Josh, you're in school. You just got your master's. Yay! Stand up. What's next? Gonna be a dentist. All right. You're gonna, you're gonna be a dentist and you're gonna help people. And you're gonna make big, bright smiles all over the place. And you're gonna make money. Hopefully, yeah, because if you weren't interested in any of that, you'd be down working at McDonald's where it's hot and greasy and nobody's smiling. Not about the right stuff anyway. So that's your dream. That's your, that's your existential plan. That's good. God wants you to have that. He said, when they were going to Babylon in captivity there, he said, I want you to build houses. I want you to plant vineyards. I want you to marry your sons and your daughters to one another. Because he said, you're going to be there for a while. And that's, that's extends, that extends to you. He wants you to build a house. And he wants you to plant a vineyard. and He wants you to have a family. And, and all of those things. Is your wife here tonight? Well, she's somewhere. <laughs> she's somewhere. It's the will of God for you to have a wife. I know that because he said it's not good for the man to be alone. You missed it. You should be running the aisles right now, but it's okay. It's okay. But this, as good as this gets... And I'm telling you, we've got it so good. I, I, I just tell you, we need to go more often. If you've never visited a third world setting, you need to go. If you've never walked down the dusty streets of a barrio, you need to go. If you've never seen people sleeping in Nipah huts like cordwood, you need to go. Because the first thing that happens when you come back is that you are so outrageously grateful and thankful for the creature comforts and the wonderful place that God has given you to live in. Need to do that. And I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that you have a plan. And I'm glad that you're in a place where you can actualize that plan. If you lived in New Delhi or in some other places in India and you were born into a certain caste a certain social class you would never there is no upward mobility you would live and die there in the dust and never have a chance of getting out you you as an American you might think well I'd walk out of that place but there's no place to walk and there's no food to eat and there's no money for you to spend on your way out you can't get out of that place and I'm just telling you uh, so so as good as you have it here, and I'm glad that you're in this place, as good as it is here, you got to keep your eye somewhere else. You got to keep your eye and keep your core and keep your center uh, built on the things of God. And the anticipation of the fact that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. So I'm going to build a house, but I'm not planning on staying in it. 
I'm going to raise a vineyard, but I'm not planning on depending on that thing forever. Because I heard about a place where God's built mansions. He said, in my house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Whatever you build here, no matter how awesome it is, it won't compare to what he's building for you over there. you got to understand that. You've got to get that. Because it's so, it's so possible to get so hung up in what's going on down down here. It's so possible to get hung up on, on what you have and what you're building and what you love down here. And I, I just tell you, we've got it good. But don't ever let it take possession of your heart and your soul. Be ready to walk away from it at any time. When the trumpet sounds, you don't want to be looking back. Remember Lot's wife. Shortest message in the Word of God. Just don't look back. Because when the trumpet sounds, we're going to happy ever after. We're going to eternity with God. We're going to a bigger house than you could build here. We're going to vineyards that never die. We're going to the tree of life and the fruit thereof will keep you alive forever. I just want you to know uh, what he has prepared there and the fellowship of his people and the fellowship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You just need to know and understand that nothing here needs to get a hold of your heart to the degree that you forget about that. So Josh, slay your dragons, chase your dreams, build your life, accomplish, make a fortune while you're at it. If that's, uh, that's going to help you actualize your, the, the, the plan of God in your life. Do all of those things, but be ready to turn on a dime and walk away from it all in, in pursuit of the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. And if you can't say amen to that, I want you to know you need to get up on the wall and throw something over to, to, to Joab tonight. You need to get up on the wall. If something's got a hold of your heart and you can't really serve God like you need to, something needs to be thrown over the wall. If something's got a hold of your heart and you can't give God everything, then you need to get up on the wall and throw something over to Joab tonight. I'm telling you, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. He's not of this world. We are not of this world, but we're on a mission. And the mission is to find somebody behind these enemy lines and turn them. You know, uh, Wednesday night, I was already, I started getting calls uh, on uh, Tuesday about uh, <laughs> first this one and that one. Hey, I've got, I've got a positive test for COVID. I've got a positive test for COVID. And before it was over, we had 15 of them that had positive tests for COVID. It's, it's, been coming, it's been coming all week. But we were watching. We were watching it on the little screen. We were watching church on Wednesday night. And Brother Jermaine preached. And the praise group sang. And the church worshiped. And the church prayed. And, uh, and, uh, and your, your sister and your daughter got the Holy Ghost and, and was baptized in Jesus' name. We were watching. She was praying right here. And you know how it is when you're watching online. Who is that? Who's that in the office? And Casey, you were here, and you were praying right beside her. And, uh, and uh, when she lifted her head, you guys have the same profile almost. You look a lot alike. And I said, oh, that's family. That's family. People are getting the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm doing there? I'm, I'm juxtaposing something that's really, really uh, kind of a drag, having COVID and, and having to sit at home for however long it is and, and all of that stuff and a little bit scary for some folks and all of that. But you know what was going on in the altar that very night? People were still getting the Holy Ghost and folks were coming to God and the Word of God was going forth and people were being baptized in Jesus' name. And I'm just going to tell you, there's always something and good going on. There's always a fight, but there's always a blessing. There's always a struggle, but there's always the goodness of God. There's always something you could get hung up on, but get your eye on what the master is doing. Get your heart involved in what he's up to. The king's business. It'll keep you healthy. It'll keep you strong. It'll keep you oriented. It'll keep you right. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise God. There's always trouble. But there's always victory. And he made this promise to the church. He said, he's talking to Peter and the boys. And he said, thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. And somebody say, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now I want you to say, I'm in the church. 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, we're in the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I I want you to know and I want you to understand there's always, implicit in these verses, there is always a battle. There is always a conflict. The gates of hell are always out there trying trying to keep something from God or trying to hold somebody in. But they can't overcome the kingdom of God. And there's always a a discussion about this as to who's moving and who's the aggressor here in, in all of this. But I'll just tell you, there is implicit in this verse victory for the church. The church is not going down. The church is going up. The church is growing. There are more people baptized in Jesus' name right now and filled with the Holy Ghost than at any other time in history. And it's only going to get better. I'm just telling you, and we're a part of the greatest generation of the church. There's going to be revival in the city of Birmingham. I'm just telling you, it's already in the in the books. It's already in the works and God is doing a work in this city we're on our way we're on our way to a place happily ever after he was in the world John chapter 1 and the world was made by him and the world knew him not he came to his own and his own received him not what's happening there well when you're when you're the representative of the kingdom of God in the earth, that that is attracted to and focused on and in love with the world, it doesn't recognize you. It doesn't, it doesn't know you. But I'm telling you, uh, Brother Stephen preached this morning about the fact that he went to his hometown of Nazareth and he opened up the scroll of Isaiah and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And uh, as he's preaching this message, they're getting kind of bowed up about him because he's identifying himself as Messiah. And they don't like it because one says, is this not Joseph's son? And, uh, and they're, they're uh, insulted and they're, and they're in disagreement and they don't, they don't like what he's saying. And they take him out, the people from his own hometown, they take him out to the edge of a hill that that city is built upon and they were going to cast him down. They were going to cast him off. I just want you to understand that Jesus has skin in the game and Jesus has not asked you to be or do anything that he has not been or done I'm just telling you everything you're going to experience in this life he's experienced he was tempted in all points like as we he was suffering he learned by the things that he suffered he was betrayed he was he was misrepresented he was lied about and and there's so many places where you can get hurt in this world he he walked in all of them and before it was over they nailed him to a cross and he died he breathed his last breath and yes he is God <clears throat> and you say well wait a minute God can't die but the word of God said hereby perceive we the love of God that he laid down his life for us I want you to know God laid down his how did he do it he took on a body he walked on the earth he kept it holy and clean then he allowed them to nail him to a cross and plunge a spear in his side and he breathed out his last breath and that body died. It was God's body. God experienced death just like you, if you live long enough, will experience death. But he, unlike you, has the power to walk into hell and the grave, kick the doors off, and in the third day, take that body back up, give it life again, and he's in that body forevermore somebody say praise the lord he had just announced the arrival of the messiah and you would think that they would be jubilant you would think that they would have been so excited but they didn't like what it was packaged in they didn't like how the kingdom of god came to them 
They were like the people at Gadara when he cast the demons out of the demoniac of Gadara. And the people from the city came and they found the demoniac sitting clothed and in his right mind. And their swine had gone off into the ocean and they were drowned. And they asked Jesus, this wonderful emissary of the kingdom of God who just cast the devil out of this demoniac that they had been trying to bind up and they had been trying to to do something with for all of these years and Jesus gave them their answer and they and they said you need to leave you need to go they besought him that he would leave uh, their coast and go away they it had an unsettling effect on them but see that's our mission That's our commander. That's who we emulate. That's who we follow. We sail right into the storm. We walk right up to the place where the demoniac dwells. We call down the power of God by the mighty name of Jesus. And he said, in my name, they'll cast out devils. In my name, they'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Anybody believe that still? I believe that. That's our calling. That's our mission. Light to the world. Healing to the sick. The the power of God to change the circumstance for people that are in a place of suffering. My God, God's called you to a great thing. The kingdom of God is the greatest thing on the face of the earth today. John would write in 1 John, For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of of the devil that's exactly who we are and that's exactly what we're called to do because that's what he does he came to seek and save the lost that's what we do we seek and we save the lost he came to destroy the works of the devils that's what we do we come to destroy the work of the devil we can't do it in our own power but we can really be the uh, the emissary of the kingdom of god in our cities and in the places where we uh, where we walk I just want you to know the first place you destroy the work of the devil is in your own life. And then you're equipped and then you're positioned to help other people break free from the confines of that. Sam, come on tonight. The early church, the early church was beaten. They were jailed. They were uh, they were threatened, and uh, I could read to you uh, uh, multiple passages from the book of Acts, just, just the book of Acts, about how they, uh, they, they were, they were uh, treated uh, and how they were beaten and how they were chained in the dungeon and, and how they were, they were threatened, and, and it was the Pharisees and it was the Jews at large and it was the, it was the uh, Gentiles and everybody came down on them. They, but you know what they did? They turned their world upside down. They went to jail and they were beaten, but they turned their world upside down. I just want you to know and to understand tonight that that is our calling 2021 we are called we are the people of God we are the church of the living God we are on our way to a place that we sing about that we think about but I'm just telling you uh, we're not there yet and we've got a lot of work to do before we get there. I don't know how long each of our journeys will be. I don't know how, how many of us will get there and who will get, bef- get there before others. I was talking to Larry Booker the other day, and I just told him that we were just talking about some place we might meet and some place we might see one another. And I, t- I reminded him of that old song about I will meet you in the morning just beyond the eastern gate. And uh, but then I told him, I said, I think that's going to be a real clouded, a crowded place because all these apostolics know that song and they don't know much about Jerusalem. So they're all going to show up at the eastern gate over there. So let's find another place to uh, to maybe get together if we both die before we see one another again. But you know what? I'm joking a little bit, but I'm really not. I plan on being there. I plan on walking in that place. But we're not going there tonight, probably. And we've got a little bit further to go. And we've got some battles to fight. And as soon as you whip the one you're fighting right now, you're going to have another one get up. Anybody fighting a giant right now? 
will go ahead, take him on, take it to him, work him over. But know this, that Monday morning, there's going to be another one. And Wednesday, something else will rise up. And you'll never come to the end of all the trouble that this world has to give. But keep your eye on happy ever after. Because you can't make enough money. You can't build a big enough place. You can't build a big enough church. You can't have enough of what this world has to offer to compare with what God is, is already built for you and prepared for you over there. Praise God. Let's take a moment here. I want you to lift your hands, lift your voice, give God some thanks and magnify Him. Hallelujah. Mighty God, worthy God, holy God, we give you praise, we magnify you, we bless your name. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Now, these fine people are about to sing something, and I want, if you're comfortable, I would like for everybody to come down around the altar. If you're not comfortable, just worship back in your pew where you are. When you get here, shake somebody's hand and tell them, I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. Shake somebody and tell them, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasure is laid. Somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't, I won't, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Praise God. Now, they're going to sing, and we're going to worship. Let's do that right now. Somebody high five and tell them it doesn't matter. We win. Come on. Whatever you're going through. Who's got a problem? Who's got a giant? We win. It doesn't matter. God's got it. Get ready to fight. Ring the bell again. Go another round. Get ready for however many rounds it's going to be. We're going to stay in the fight. We're not going to turn around. We're behind enemy lines. We've got a mission. We're just like our God. He came down and he walked this place with one thing in mind. I'm going to find somebody 
to build a mansion for somebody to take to heaven with me. God bless you. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord with you on a Sunday night. All of our church family that's hunkered down at home, we love you. And we miss you here. And we're going to get through this season. But you just have good church right where you are. Lord bless.